Um, was wondering if you would start by introducing who you are and how you came to this space. Well, my name is Delton Chen. I'm actually an Australian engineer. Perhaps you can tell uh, by my voice. I came in to, into this space because by profession I'm a geohydrologist and it's my job to understand the hydrological system. I was working in the mining sector, but I could see climate change was going to be a huge problem for civilization, and I decided to leave mining and work on this problem. So, um, all of you out there, uh, how many people, raise your hand if you know what a terrarium is. Let's see, oh, just about everybody. That's great, if you don't, you should find out, they're really cool. Uh, there's YouTube videos where you can build entire enclosed systems that last for years that my eight-year-old is really into. Uh, but um, Delton, you have a really, really great uh, metaphor using a terrarium for understanding planet Earth, what we're doing, and some of the solutions to the problems that we've caused. That's right. I am an engineer, so I think in systems. And in engineering and problem solving and other disciplines as well, you have to start with a conceptual model that matches the problem. So I was very interested in the conceptualization of global warming from an economic perspective and physical. After a lot of analysis, I came to an interpretation that our biosphere is physically analogous to a terrarium, which is a closed bottle. Matter can't get in and out. Uh, there's a plant inside and water and soil and sunlight gives it energy, this system is actually perfectly analogous to the Earth, which is a closed system. There's no mass exchange, there's sunlight coming in. So physically, it's similar. But the question is, what does it tell us about net zero? Because a terrarium, and there's a, the example on the slide, it's 50 years old. It's survived in that bottle. Thus, it must have achieved net zero for homeostasis. So, is it telling us something? How do we think like a plant? And the interpretation that I came to is that thermodynamically, the terrarium is actually comprised of two major system types. You have the photosynthesizing chloroplast, and then you have the respiring cells, which are all the other cells and most of the other animals, fungi, and the plant itself. And so if you think of this system as two specialized cell types or two specialized organism types, there must be a reason, why is it that way? And the, the idea that came to me is that nature specializes uh, genetically, in the case of the terrarium, it's genetic specialization, and I believe the same thing is happening in our civilization. We have an economy which is specializing for combustion through the availability of uh, biofuels and fossil fuels, and uh, we use it, the energy, to produce goods and services, like a superorganism respiring to find food, if you like. So the resolution through this conceptual model is we need a parallel economy, which is analogous to photosynthesis, but its role is a parallel economy is to conventionally mitigate and also very important, if not more important, to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it because we're going to need that service. Yeah, so you're talking about ecosystem services, basically. Correct. A lot of people don't know what ecosystem services are. I would guess a lot of people actually in this audience do. Who knows what ecosystem services are? Raise your hand. Oh my goodness. Can you quickly define that? <laughs> well, to me, it's, it explains itself. A service that's not for traditional goods and services, but it's to provide um, protection and regeneration of the biosphere so we can live longer on the planet. That's, that's my short answer. You know, um, interestingly, I had a consulting gig once where I uh, was supposed to find out how many Americans understood what ecosystem services were. This was like, oh, about eight years ago, and almost nobody. So I guess we're still there. <laughs> um, so let's get to GCR. Um, can you tell me what GCR is at a high level and where it came from, what it's doing? Sure. GCR stands for Global Carbon Reward. If you haven't heard of it, it's because it's not well known. It's been in gestation for 
eight years, and my team and I are now uh, looking for funding to do a demonstration. So to understand, we should probably begin with the problem space. The problem space is we need uh, roughly $3 trillion extra for targeted uh, climate finance, mitigation, cleaning up energy and industry. We need uh, roughly $1 trillion additional finance for carbon removal through the century. Not only do we need to manage the quantity of carbon in the carbon cycle, we also need to manage the quality, meaning the context of how that carbon's stored, whether it's in the ecosystem or in the ground, very important. The solution space that's conventional are the standard policies from economists. So you have policies like taxes, carbon taxes, which everybody loves. Then you have, I'm jo joking. Then, <laughs> then you have- uh, I was late. <laughs> <laughs> Good clarification there. I shouldn't try to be funny, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you should. Um, then you have cap and trade, which is quite, uh, it's working quite well in Europe and China, it's recently introduced. Then you have subsidies. Of course, we have the Inflation Reduction Act here in the United States. But what I claim in this, that solution space, which is standardised and is backed up by uh, quite well accepted theory, you know, in textbooks, I claim it's missing a key policy, which is the carbon reward, and not only the policy, but the conceptual model for the market failure is also missing some really important pieces, which ties in with the policy. So the policy and the conceptual model are both expanded in, in my work. And if you're interested, go to our website. The theory is called the carbon pricing matrix. Uh, it's, a, it's a relational diagram, explains all the theory for people who are really deeply interested in that. Most people aren't, but for the economists, it's incredibly important. So uh, the solution space uh, is that we have a new policy with a theory to back it up. And why it's different is because the reward is not a carbon credit. Uh, we're offering the reward with a carbon currency, and people probably think that's got to be a crypto, surely. No, it's not a cryptocurrency. It's not um, money to buy things with. You can't go shopping with it. And it's not a carbon credit, so you can't offset with it. So really, the value and the context for the global carbon reward, the carbon currency, is more about what it isn't. What it is, is a financial asset and a price signal for carbon removal and conventional climate mitigation. And uh, behind that, we need a whole financial mechanism to supply it to the market and to give it value through central bank. Um, it's really, sum it up, it's a public finance guarantee that will involve the world's central banks. Um, so that's supply, that's demand, and behind all of that, again, are a lot of details about how to manage a reward that's scalable and can trigger an exponential response because that's what we need at the end of the day, an exponential response mm -hmm. if we're going to keep one and a half alive, which is going to be very, very difficult. Well, um, and if it's backed by central banks, wow, that's not very risky. I'm that, not joking, I'm being serious. <laughs> Alexis, exactly. That's amazing. Yes, so um, the theory ties in with the purpose of the policy. So the purpose of the policy is very important, the objective. For taxes, the theory is that it's to improve the efficiency of markets, which is about utilities, uh, it's about costs versus benefits, if you're familiar with it. Uh, but the really important point here is that the carbon reward is not for that purpose. It's to manage risk, and it's to provide a safe carbon budget. And safety means quantity, and it means quality. Where does the carbon go? Because it's got to go into regenerative uh, work to protect the biosphere and to allow communities to, to improve their well-being and stabilize themselves with sustainable economics. Yeah, so these ecosystem services in um, the parts of the world where carbon can be sequestered or taken back up, um, it's going to be able to provide stable jobs for people to support the ecosystem services around the world. So that's the other side of it, the social side of it. Now, we've, now that we've talked about the investor side of it. Yes. Um, I'd like to make a quick comment about the sustainability. I was talking to someone from Suriname, and he said, 
uh, one reason they can't protect their forests is they don't have a sustainable economy. Without that l income, there is degradation of the uh, forests because of the need for extraction. We've got to stop the extraction with an alternative economy that can price and value the protection of the biosphere and the climate. And for investors, there are multiple ways for investors to enjoy the global carbon reward. So at one level, it's to earn it for mitigation projects. At another level, um, currency traders, mum and dad investors, institutional investors can trade the currency and enjoy the appreciation over decades. And the third way is for everybody to co-invest in projects. Uh, microfinance is, I think, the future for this type of policy. Yeah, well, um, you kind of already pre-answered a question that I had, um, which is this idea that, um, like you said, it's not crypto. People always assume something is crypto. People are scared of crypto now. Um, but it's like the early days of the internet, the Wild West early days of the internet, you know. Who knew AOL would tank and Google would rule the world back then? And it's going to be the same way with these blockchain technologies. Um, we just have ones that are going to come through and be great and solve these problems. Yes, I was at a conference last week in uh, Colombia with some fantastic people innovating in blockchains for sustainability. And they're, they're not competing with each other, they're helping each other. And there's a feeling that we don't really know what the solutions are going to be, but if we keep innovating, some solutions will emerge. And uh, I think the exciting thing is if we can get the global carbon reward to uh, be tabled at the UN eventually, considered or even implemented, all, that, all of that innovation based on blockchains and other technologies, scientific, field measurement, etc., will be leveraged dramatically with this policy. Yeah, um, so yesterday we had a debate about uh, ESG, should we keep it? And uh, I was also with another panel around impact investing in ESG and where they meet. And it feels like what you have developed here is something that really fits into that model that already exists and has infrastructure in place to just go. I think so. I think from what I've heard in the media, ESG has problems too, it has limitations. It, it does, but we, we need to have solutions that move us forward into the future. Like, we've got to mitigate carbon 20 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Agreed. So I, I think that the carbon reward and its metrics will complement ESG, and it will give corporates another metric and index to really give more value to their ESG statements um, and also their profitability. So I think we might be lucky enough to get a couple of questions from the audience. Um, use your app to put the questions in and someone will be running me the questions. Um, but while you ask your questions, I do have a wrap up question for you, which is what is one thing that our audience here should take away uh, from this conversation and how can people support GCR? Well, uh, a bit of background. Um, my team, we've been developing this policy literally for eight years and we reached a stage uh, that we, we believe we understand how to demonstrate the policy. That's really important because it's a complex uh, financial mechanism, new ideas, and what we've settled on is a strategic plan that we want to uh, interview stakeholders, especially decision makers in business and the public sector, the people who control the money, who make those big decisions. If we interview them, we can um, understand if the policy will change the way people make decisions about investing, and that's the feedback we need. We'll also interview experts in central banking, we'll do economic assessments, and importantly, we will also test um, our co-benefit platform for stakeholders that include community, people such as yourselves, because this policy has uh, features where everybody can influence outcomes by um, undertaking surveys to register what's important for yourself when we mitigate and decarbonise the economy. 
So the co-benefits cover community well-being, ecological health, and energy reliability. So we're going to uh, do that stakeholder mapping for all of that. We need to raise maybe six or seven million to do this over two, three years. My expectation is, uh, Alexis, is that as we do this, we will attract governments and central banks, and they will want to kickstart this into pilots. And as that happens, I believe it can be tabled at the UN. So maybe you guys have read our bios, but I am so nerding out. We both have PhDs. So basically, you're showing a scientific method to proof test uh, and, pi and pilot to show that you, this idea is really foolproof. So anyway, you can talk to Delton later. He'll be around. And that theory he told you about, I wish I had a whiteboard and could put you on the spot, because he can literally put it on a napkin and make it understandable. <laughs> but uh, you can find him later. So for now, we've got some questions. We've got a lot of questions. Um, let's see. I like this first one here. What technologies have the most promise for carbon capture, and what's holding them back? And now I'm going to lightning round you with these questions. Try and do it in 60 seconds or less so we can get to as many people's questions as possible, because they are flying in. OK, you mean carbon capture as in carbon dioxide uh, removal, not capture at the smokestack? So at the smokestack, that's quite controversial because it's expensive and the mining companies or the, the big polluters haven't really uh, spent the money on that. But for carbon dioxide removal, I do hear from scientists that algae has good potential. And I think the key point is how much does it cost? You see, the problem with carbon dioxide removal is that it needs energy. And that energy generally can't be used to produce regular goods and services. And this is the key problem. If that's the case, then it's not going to be profitable and you can't fund it with loans and debt. Thus, it has to be paid for and hence we would need something like the reward. But uh, just to point out, I don't really personally know what the best technologies are today. Algae seems to show some promise. However, the point of a market policy is not to predict those things. It's to put out a price signal over 100 years, a very long-term price signal, and let the market find the solutions, not the policymaker. Mm -hmm. The market will. And then we put the pressure on them to make it not good stuff, like kelp farming instead of dangerous geoengineering. Um, so let's see. Um, this is a very, let's see. This is a lot like the idea of the carbon in the book of ministry for the future. What is the critical first step to get this to the table at the national and global level? Okay, it, it is actually featured in the, the novel, The Ministry for the Future. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson was inspired by some papers I wrote, and he used that as a framing for the novel. Uh, as I said, the theory of change here is that we need to convince policymakers and economists that it's a rational policy, it's cogent, because there are so many uh, details and issues about uh, how to prevent gaming and corruption and how not to distort markets in, in bad ways and create moral hazard. So a lot of work has gone into understanding how we can deliver a reward, what the rules and the guidelines are. So the theory of change is we, we really just need to do the demonstration in a way that's officially recognised by a state government, say the government of California, or a national government and some institutions, and then we're effectively in the system. We're in the narrative with institutions. And I believe, uh, you know, an idea that time, its time has come, it can't be stopped. So it will uh, create its own momentum. Well, that's how change works. One person does it, and then everyone else wants to copy it, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, this is an interesting one. Is the GCR inflationary? Yes, it can be. And it also doesn't have to be. So just very quickly, um, the way the price signal works is that it's a technically you could call it mitigate and trade. We set a, a minimum price for very long term. 
we issue uh, the reward as a currency and people can trade the currency. So for a period of time, this currency will have a rising value, like for 30 to 50 years. Thus it becomes an investment vehicle, an asset. Because of the central bank guarantee, the private sector, the currency traders, investors, they will buy it. Actually, everyone will want to buy it. And so it will fund itself through this uh, public finance guarantee that influences sentiment. Once we pass the peak in value of the carbon currency, it can then decline and stabilise. But through that experience, central banks may have to buy it. If they do that, they will expand the money supply to buy the carbon currency. And this is where you get monetary inflation. But it's a very complex topic because it's not just about monetary inflation, it's also about CPI inflation because of global warming. So we're going to trade off with some monetary inflation to avoid the global warming impacts and that inflation that's physical and worse. Because monetary yeah. inflation is temporary, but physical damages to the climate is permanent for thousands or tens of thousands of years. And there's another, one more point, and then I'll finish. Um, That's a great point, though. It, it's a very important <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, one more point is that uh, policymakers, governments and central banks, they can deleverage uh, recessions and debt through a combination of inflationary policies, such as printing more money, and deflationary policies, such as raising taxes and so on. So you combine the two. And this is what Ray Dalio has been saying for a long time, to deleverage a recession or debt, you need inflationary and deflationary policies working together. Well, and those things are gonna happen regardless, so why not have a currency that helps the planet, since it's already happening? You will have to get In you cycles, on the team. <laughs> all the time. Um, yeah. Okay, here's a similar one. Does the carbon pricing matrix factor in needs for global degrowth? A very good question. Uh, I, I'll answer this just as um, quickly as I can. There is a philosophical debate or discussion around whether we should continue with green growth or do we need degrowth. It's kind of like um, a dichotomy and it, that dichotomy actually, in my opinion, is based around an assumption that civilization and our economy is one system. If it's one system, then th these are your choices. However, if you look at the, the slide of the terrarium and the butterfly with the two systems, uh, our conceptual model is different. We have two systems working together in like a symbiosis. So if we have too much emissions, we transfer resources, purchasing power, capital and labour from the conventional economy, the consumptive economy, to the mitigation economy. And this rebalances the carbon budget. So if you follow this approach, we don't need degrowth. Maybe not initially anyway. The problem with degrowth, in my opinion, is that the economists and the central banks and the people in charge of the financial system will just have a freak out because uh, the financial system and lending is based on growth. You have to have growth. It's the definition of capitalism. <laughs> yes, you have to have growth to sustain the debts. So um, the way we're approaching it through money makes some sense, I think, because we're creating a complementary currencies which can deleverage the, the, the growth problem and mitigate at the same time. I'm not going to go too far into it. Maybe we can talk with people afterwards about it. But to me, it's really a biological model of how the earth works and it's, it's an evolutionary model and uh, I can't even get into the Red Queen hypothesis right now, but I have one more question here. This seems to have died, but the question was something to the effect of, <laughs> can you speak to uh, the criticisms of the carbon market? Today's market, mm -hmm. well, this isn't so much a criticism as an observation. The uh, carbon market for offsetting Theoretically and practically, it's not really designed to mitigate. It's really designed to lower the aggregate cost of mitigation by allowing offsetting. And the fact that certain companies voluntarily offset does, does actually mitigate, but the point is they're doing it be voluntarily because the policies aren't there. So we have a kind of a policy hole, and I don't think offsetting credits will get us 
close to one and a half, uh, it's not going to move the needle. The reward, on the other hand, does not offset, and all the carbons retired immediately. So uh, the way I see it, it's kind of completing a jigsaw puzzle of social relationships and agreements. And once we have the full jigsaw puzzle, we have enough agreements that we can manage uh, the carbon budget, at least much better than we're doing today. Right, and the policy is so much of a key because um, as we were talking about yesterday, uh, I don't even think it was a conversation with you, but I was looking at the Unilever story and it was forced, it was forced by policy. And that's why the US is so bad <laughs> at mitigating our carbon because we don't have the policy yet. So even without the policy though, if you have the credits, it's going to create an incentive so that goes around the policy angle. So it all kinds of feeds into each other, the three components, if that makes sense. Kind of. It's a matrix of policies yeah. and relationships, and it's probabilistic. Well, um, we've got a minute, just under a minute left, so I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. Where are you going to be later? Where can people come find you and talk to you? Well, I'll actually be in uh, this San Francisco Bay Area until the 4th of December. I'm giving a, another presentation on the 2nd of, sorry, 4th of December, I'll be here. On the 2nd of November, I'm speaking at Santa Cruz, and this Wednesday night, I'm speaking at North Berkeley with the Citizens Climate Lobby. But if you want to contact me, just grab me, and I'm happy to talk to everybody if I have time. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, everybody, let's give a big, warm round of applause for Delton Chen and his revolutionary work with GCR. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you.